All right, hey JPy, it's Keenan. So I'm actually fulfilling my promise and making a lesson for you about how to do CS things. It's not fully feature complete, but it's pretty good to get you started and I'll make more later. By the way, congratulations on getting into college. Um, that's a huge deal and is awesome. All right, so yeah. So here's the, the deal. Um, CS106 and CS107 are the CS classes that you take freshman year here at Stanford. And I think that they present material a little backwards, so I'm going to do it in reverse and start with the hard stuff because it's not actually that bad. Um, and then work your way to the easy stuff. And it sounds confusing, but it won't be, I promise. All right, so becoming a CS girl in 30 minutes, the Jameson Lecture Series, part one. So what can a computer do? How does a computer work? Why we have programming languages, basic shared concepts in all programming languages, and some specific examples in Java, which I think is the best programming language to learn in. Um, and we will start with that. So let's start with what a computer can do. Really, it's not capable of very much. It can store and read values, it can manipulate values mathematically, like add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo, which is just the remainder after you take a division. Um, so like 7 modulo 6 would be 1, because 7 divided by 6 is 1, remainder 1. Um, and a computer can binary conditionally decide what to do. So that means like, if a value is greater than a certain value, it'll perform some actions, and if it is less than a certain value, it would perform a different set of actions. Which is, that piece really is what lets computers be as intelligent as they are and do crazy things like fly airplanes and, well, yeah. All right, so how do we tell a computer to do these operations? It's not actually that hard. We just give it a list of commands. So we'll say, store the value 3 in storage space 1. And then maybe we'll say if storage space 1 is greater than 2, jump to instruction 4. And then subtract 3 from storage space 1 and multiply storage space 1 by 4. So if a computer were reading this, it would start at 1. And the computer would say, all right, I'm going to go find storage space 1. So in, its, in the computer's digital infinite chest of drawers that it has to put information into, it'll find the drawer labeled storage space 1, probably the first drawer on its infinite chest of drawers, open it up and put a 3 in there, and then close the drawer. And then it'll go to the second instruction, and the second instruction says, if storage space 1 is greater than 2, jump to instruction 4. So it goes to its infinite chest of drawers, grabs storage space number 1, pulls out the value, finds that it's a 3 because that's what we just put in there, checks if that's greater than 2, in fact it is, so it jumps to instruction 4, skipping instruction 3, and it multiplies storage space 1 by 3, so at the end of the day, storage space 1 has 9 in it. And that's basically assembly code. It's um, not that hard. The cool thing about assembly, as a side note, um, is that it really is this simple. People make it out to be this extraordinarily complicated thing because it's all ones and zeros, but it's really not that bad. Um, so computers need us to write all of that in ones and zeros. And that is a total pain in the ass. So computer programmers being the lazy creatures that they are, they don't do that. So the solution is to write abstractions, to write things that write other things so that we don't have to write the nasty parts. So rather than write zeros and ones, we, write, we have languages called assembly languages where we basically just type in shorthand for what we want the computer to do and then have a program that remembers what each shorthand command corresponds to in zeros and ones. Um, and you don't actually need to care about what's on this slide, um, especially the parts that look really complicated with all the division symbols and the parentheses and stuff. 
basically that's just showing you what actual assembly code looks like. Um, like what this what this line move L percent EAX comma parentheses percent EBP um, does is basically the same as command one right here where it stores a value in a storage space except in this case we're storing the value in the storage space named percent EAX into the storage space named percent EBP um, and the next line adds 10 to the storage space percent EBP again you don't need to care this is just so that you have some fundamental understanding of like the computer isn't this mysterious machine really it's just a bunch of wires moving electrons around and you're telling it what to do even though you're going to be telling it through a whole bunch of layers of abstractions because we didn't stop at assembly we decided to that that also was too much of a pain in the ass so even though writing zeros and ones had been solved writing in this nasty move l percent eax comma percent ebp is just it's a nightmare so we don't write in that either we write in programming languages that compile into assembly which then compiles into zeros and ones um now by nature of the whole deal programming languages can only really do what assembly can do so you start to I, you see all of the same patterns in programming languages they just maybe are expressed a little bit differently so there will still be if statements there will still be storing into values and reading from values and doing math and that's basically all you can do but with those operations you can make some extremely complicated cool things alright so how do programming languages work um, you can store and read values you can manipulate values and you can conditionally perform certain behavior it's exactly the same as what computers can do down on the electrical level it's just now we're going to be saying it in a way that's a little bit more human friendly okay so in order to store and read values you have to tell the computer or the programming language what kinds of values you're going to be dealing with um, so if we look here at the second bullet point int Jameson number equals zero um, what this is doing is it's saying computer I'm about to make a thing that is going to store an integer um, and as a refresher in case you forgot the math um, integers are solid numbers they have no decimals at the end they're negative infinity through positive infinity counting by one um, so int is saying it's going to be that kind of value and then we put a name on it we say Jameson number and then we say equals and then we provide the value that we're going to be putting in it so what the computer does when it sees this line is it's going to go to its infinite chest of drawers get out a sharpie find a drawer that's unoccupied and write on it Jameson number then open the drawer and put a zero in it and then every time in the future that you say Jameson number the computer is going to know to go to that drawer and get out the value that you put in it which is really wickedly cool and is so much more fun and efficient than writing this all out in assembly code and having to remember that percent EAX is the one that you want instead of percent EBP um, and God forbid you had to write this out in zeros and ones I don't even want to think about that um, so the general form for doing this is type variable name equals value and this is one of um, don't don't be afraid to commit this to memory because this is a foreign language but unlike other foreign languages computer programming only really has four important vocabulary words um, and this is one of them so you will have plenty of space in your head for all sorts of other things alright so to manipulate values you just say the name of the variable and the value that you want to put into it so you can say Jameson number equals seven and the computer will go to its infinite chest of drawers find the drawer with Jameson number written on it and go and put a seven in it or you could say Jameson number equals Jameson number times ten and then it's going to go find the Jameson number drawer pull out the number that's in there currently a seven multiply it by 10 make it 70 and then stick it back in the drawer 
Jameson number equals Jameson number divided by 7. So it goes to the Jameson number drawer, pulls out the number, which is 70, divides by 7, gets 10, puts it in this, um, in the Jameson number drawer. Now we're going to make a new variable, int Keenan number equals 3. So the computer gets out its Sharpie and goes and writes Keenan number on a new drawer um, and puts a 3 in there. And now Jameson number equals parentheses Jameson number times Keenan number modulo 3. So now what we're going to do, the computer is going to take this by parentheses first and then modulo and then the assignment. So first it's going to get Jameson number, which is equal to 10 after this long string of operations. Then it's going to multiply it by Keenan number, which is 3. So we end up with 30. And then it's going to modulo 3. So it's going to divide by 3 and get the remainder. And 30 divided by 3 has no remainder. So the result of this is 0. So then Jameson number is 0. Kind of long-winded, but that's basically the extent of variables. And they take like a week to present these in CS106 here. And I think it's totally unnecessary because all you really need to remember is that it is a giant infinite chest of drawers and the computer has a Sharpie that it is using to remember everything that you're telling it. Um, so as reference, here is a list of all of the math manipulations that you can do. There's um, assigning a value, multiplying two values together, subtracting a value, adding a value, dividing a value, and modulo. Um, I have made a cheat sheet for you so that you don't actually need to remember this. Um, plus you'll learn it eventually as you use this stuff and it's all pretty intuitive. I mean, except for modulo, everything is what you would expect. All right. So now we're going to do some conditional behavior. Um, if condition do things. It's a very English-like formulation. Um, unfortunately, computers are dumber than humans, so we can't tell them what to do in programs. In plain English, we have to provide a little bit of brackets and colons and things to make everything work. Um, but we'll get through it, I promise. Okay, so if Jameson number double equal sign 7, Jameson number equals 3. Um, so what happens here is if Jameson number is equal to 7, the reason we use two equal signs is because one equal sign means assign the value here to this. So if we were to say if Jameson number 1 equals sign 7, what it would do is it would actually, it wouldn't even bother comparing the two, it would just put a 7 in Jameson number and carry on. Um, which is silliness, but it, it kind of makes sense um, that programming languages wouldn't want to have it floating around that an equal sign means different things in different contexts. So instead, we just make it so that double equals is always a comparison, single equals is always an assignment. Um, so if Jameson number is equal to 7, then we'll set Jameson number equal to 3. So all of the stuff inside of these curly brackets gets done if the condition inside of these parentheses is met. And at the end of every statement in code, you're going to put a semicolon. So that's at the end of every line, you put a semicolon, hit return. It helps the computer understand when things, when statements are done. Um, again, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I wish it were English, but it isn't. Um, so we have to hold the computer's hand a little bit so that it knows what's going on. All right, so here are all of the fancy conditions. Well, not all of them by any stretch, but most of the fancy conditions that you will be using on a daily basis. Not daily, unless you work in computers, which you probably won't because you're an actor. Um, but that's, you know, maybe someday they'll have you making your website for your theater or something, and then you'll know all these things, and everyone will think you're a genius. And you will be, and it'll be cool. Um, so double equals is equality. A greater than sign and an equal sign is greater than or equal to, a less than sign and equal sign is less than or equal to, less than, greater than. Double and is the logical and. So it's like if condition A and condition B are both met. So say like Jameson number greater than 7 and and Jameson number less than 9. So that would be like it'll only say that this is 
this whole parent parenthetical statement, the statement inside of these parentheses is true, if part A and part B both evaluate to true. This vertical double bar thing, and the double bar is on the far right side of your keyboard underneath the delete key. Um, you, If you put one of these, it'll evaluate to true if either A or B or both are true. So if any part of your statement is true, then this will evaluate to true, which is actually quite useful a lot of the time. Um, like say, if you have if you want a value to be excluded from something, like if you want it to be if a is greater than 7 or less than 3, do this. But if it's between those two values, don't do this. Then you could be like, if a is greater than 7 or a is less than 3, do this thing. I don't know. It, it took me like two years after I started programming to realize that this was a thing. And I wish someone had told me earlier because it's fucking awesome. All right, so some other cool things to keep in mind. Um, when you're writing code, often is not you want to leave little notes in English to yourself or to other people to remind you or others what's going on. Um, so if you put two slashes in front of a line on, in your code, it will be totally ignored by the compiler and you are free to write whatever the fuck you want. Um, without any constraints you don't need to like remember to put semicolons after it and the computer won't think that it's code and try to do something with it and then explode um so you are free range whatever you want with this which is cool and very useful i i highly recommend that you do leave notes to yourself it's something that beginning programmers tend not to do and i think it would actually be helpful like if you if you write justifications to yourself about why you're doing something then when you come back and look at the code the next day it'll make more sense um all right so loops are another thing that's important to understand and i don't think they're terribly complex um from a from a conceptual level so while this condition is met perform this operation again it's very english like What's going to happen here is as long as this condition is true, it'll keep doing this. So it'll do this and then go back and say, is this condition still true? It is? Okay, let's do this again. And then it'll go back and check the condition again. And if the condition is still true, it'll do it again. And it'll keep doing that forever. And you actually um, will often run into cases where it will actually keep doing that forever. Like imagine Jameson number is equal to zero, right? And so you say while Jameson number is less than Keenan number, which is some non-zero number like three, Jameson number equals Jameson number times two, but zero times two is still zero. So you then go back to the condition and say, is zero less than two? Why, yes, zero equals zero. Is zero less than two? Oh my goodness, zero equals zero. And so you end up in this infinite loop and your computer gets that beach ball of death thing going on. And that's really embarrassing. So. Be careful when writing these that it actually will um, finish. <laughs> yeah, I've run into that problem so many times. I, before I realized how to force quit programs, I would have to restart my computer. But I have been educated since then. Um, yeah, while loops, I mean, they're very simple. It's, it's super useful for doing some stupid operation over and over and over again. In fact, that's really what computers are super useful for doing. Um, so while loops are the bread and butter of getting computers to do what they're good at, which is perform calculation without error, lightning fast, over tons and tons of boring data. All right, so um, there's good news for programmers out there like yourself. All programming languages are pretty much the same. I mean, they all like to sell themselves as a little bit different, and to some extent, they are all a little bit different, but really, the guts are all the same because they're living on top of exactly the same architecture that can do exactly the same things. Um, so all the variables, all the math, all the conditions, all the loops, all of that stuff is all the same across every, um, every programming language that you're going to run across which is really encouraging. It means you learn it once 
and it's done. So by the time you finish learning one language, with like maybe a week of more work, you can jump into another language without um, looking like a noob, which is sweet. I mean, it means that when you when you move to new jobs and stuff, and they're using new languages, you can get up to speed almost instantly. Whereas if you move from Spain to Paris, learning French is kind of a pain in the ass. So computers have humans beat in that sense. All right. So the last big building block um, before you know all of computer programming, which will be awesome, is understanding functions. So a function works just like it does in math class. Um, it takes inputs and it provides outputs. So it's it tends to be written a little differently in different languages, but really it's always doing exactly the same thing. Um, and it's built, yeah, it's the same, it's the same idea. Um, inputs are variables, output is a value. The output is universally called the return value um, because the function does all of its stuff like, I don't know, right. Imagine a function that fetches a bone for you. It's like a little robot and it fetches a bone and then when it goes and gets the bone this little robot comes back and then the function quote unquote returns. Uh, that's a shitty metaphor but it's that's the idea is that like when a function gets done with something then it returns the value that it got from doing it um, and that's the return value. Yeah that was confusing. Ignore everything I just said it'll all become clear in the next slide or two. Um, the main reason to have functions is so that you don't have to write the same code a whole bunch of times over. Um, again, because programmers are super lazy. So if you write, if you write a piece of code that takes the square root of a number, you don't want to have to write that every time you need a square root. Instead, you just put it inside of a function, and then every time you want the square root of something, you just say, oh, function what is the square root of this? And then the function will do it for you and then return you the value that is the square root and you are good to carry on without copy pasting thousands of lines. So it's a nice thing to have. All right, so a function written in C. And C is a gross language. Um, so we'll ignore most of the details here, but this is just so that you get a sense of a couple different languages and the way they do it. So C is the the language that's like assembly, or it's the closest thing to assembly that you're gonna find in programming languages. It's like, uh, C is like riding dragons. This is a sweet metaphor that's just now coming to me. C is like riding dragons. So what happens is it's incredibly powerful if you know how to do it right, but it's a total pain in the ass, and if you fuck up, you will get burned. Oh, that was a sweet metaphor. Whereas Java, and Python and all of these other slightly higher level languages um, are much more forgiving. They're like riding bunny rabbits or Volkswagen beetles where they they don't bite back if you mess up. They maybe beep at you a little bit but they don't like cause your computer to explode in a ball of flame. Where C might actually do that. Um, okay, so the deal with C is when you write a function, you'll write the return value, you'll write the name of the function, and then in parentheses, you'll put all of the things that the function takes as parameters, just like in math. So if you were to write like f of x equals 2x, you would say int f parentheses int x parentheses opening curly brackets to say what we're going to do in the function, return two times x, semicolon, parentheses. I think that's in one of these slides somewhere. If it isn't, that's a good example. Um, to use a function, we call the function. So we just type out name of function, input one, input two, input three, and then that whole block in your code is as though it is a value. It's the value that the function spits out. So if we say int and PowerPoint capitalized this for me, but it's supposed to be a lowercase, but okay, we'll gloss over that. Int Jameson function output equals Jameson function parentheses Jameson number. So if we had written a Jameson function, 
it would then take Jameson number as an input, do some mystery voodoo to it, return its output, and the output would get put into this variable. Okay. If that doesn't make sense, email me and I will explain it further. Um, so here's a real world example in Java of, um, of calling a function. Int Jameson root equals math dot sqrt, which stands for square root, parentheses, Jameson number, parentheses, semicolon. So math dot square root is the name of the function provided by Java. Basically, Java has written a whole bunch of functions for you that make your life easier. Calculating a square root on a computer is not often a function that is built in. Sometimes it is, um, but often it isn't, and you have to write your own math methods to get there without actually ha having it. And getting there only using the multiplication, addition, subtraction, etc. is a total pain in the ass and requires a lot of while loops. Um, and so it's nice that they do this for you, because then you can just kind of say the name and out comes the value that you want and it gets put in a variable and then you can use it. Um, all right, here's another cool function that Java provides. System.out.println, print ln, um, is going to take a string, which is just anything in quotes, and print it out to the terminal. And the terminal is this little hacker voodoo box that I will, um, either I will explain it to you or you will learn about it from the homework that I'm going to give you after the end of this. Um, yeah, actually, you'll probably learn about it from that. Basically, it's just a typewriter. Um, it's like a little digital typewriter at the bottom of your screen that has text on it. And you can write the text from your code. And this is a great way to like let you know what your code is doing. Um, so system.out.println, Jameson is a CS girl, is going to print down here, Jameson is a CS girl. And it'll be very exciting when it works and you'll feel really good about yourself. Um, I always do. It's such a high to have your program finally work when it isn't working for a while, which will happen all the time and you have to bear with it. Um, so once again, system.out.println is a function that Java provides to you so you don't actually have to write it. Um, and you'll, you'll use a lot of those and they're very useful. Um, so Jameson is a CS girl is the input and we really don't care about the output. Um, but we care about the side effects of calling the function. So we, i.e. the side effect is printing to the console. So you don't actually care that the, whether the function returns a value, you care that inside of the function, something happens. And a side effect of that thing happening is that out on the console, it now says Jameson is a CS girl. All right, so to actually write any of this code, well, actually let's step back. Congratulations, you are now done with like two quarters worth of computer science. And admittedly, you probably understood half of that and can implement none at all. But um, conceptually, you are now way, way ahead of most Stanford freshmen, which feels good because Stanford freshmen are sometimes kind of smart. Um, so congratulations, give yourself a round of applause. You're also, coincidentally, already in college, which is another really cool thing to be. Um, so now we're going to talk about your homework, because you can't actually learn this stuff unless you do this stuff. So I've come up with assignments for you. Well, ha I haven't done it. The Stanford faculty has. Um, but I'm going to piggyback off of them, because they're a very qualified bunch. So to actually write Java code, um, you tend to use these things called integrated development environments. And basically what they do is they just give you a text editor um, and a little button and a bunch of other features. But the little button usually has a, like a green something on it. And you click on it and it runs your code for you. It handles all of the nasty little like turning the code into assembly and running the assembly on the operating system and doing all that stuff. It just works. So you hit the button and it works, or if it isn't going to work, it'll like tell you what line is broken, which is so helpful. Um, yes, they're very convenient. So 
two major choices for Java. There's Eclipse and NetBeans. And these are kind of big competitors. NetBeans is the official one by Java. Eclipse is the open source one. Eclipse is better, so use that. Um, here's your homework. Visit this website. This is the CS106A class site. Um, and look at their handouts on downloading Eclipse, using Carol with Eclipse, and Assignment 1. That will tell you... So Carol is the name of this little robot that they've constructed that lets you um, move a little robot around on a screen with relatively few Java commands, which makes it feel super great because you actually get to... Uh, you get to see feedback with what you're doing almost immediately. Um, the Weenies in CS106A, which is the class that this assignment was designed for, haven't learned about variables when they do this assignment. But I think that is ass backwards. So you have learned about variables, and you should use them um, because it makes the assignment better. And with that, right, for help, I have constructed a cheat sheet. There's also plenty of stuff on their website, but feel free to email slash Facebook me if you have run into troubles. Yeah. Um, all right, so that is the whirlwind tour of computer science at Stanford and getting started. I'll make more videos like this, and I'm planning to make like some cool online toys slash tools that you can learn to use to learn basics. Um, well, because, hello. oh hey, what's Have up? Have fun talking to your personal Skype or whatever. It's my sister. I'm oh. making a. She wanted me to make her a video for code. Aww. So I'm doing. Hi, that. little Keenanet. Yes, this is Monica. She's interrupting the video. She's Bye. on her way. Goodbye, Monica. Um. All right. So that's actually about it. Yeah. Well done, making it through this, if you actually made it through this. I'm not sure that you'll actually be listening at this point, but if you are, I love you. Good work. Um, yeah, I hope Minnesota isn't too cold and everything is going well. All right, let me see if I can figure out how to stop this.